Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kata Beilin, Faculty Director of Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies Program at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And I would like to welcome you to uh, a talk uh, in our special series on uh, visual approaches to the Hispanic world. Um, today is a very special day for me because I'm going to be present my own work, a documentary film and that is uh, based on my research that I co-directed with Avi Weinstein uh, and that is titled Maya Land Listening to the Bees. Um, and uh, this is a um, proper moment to say thank you to everyone who made this uh, film possible. Um, Bradshaw Knight Foundation, Graduate School of the University of Wisconsin Medicine, Holt Center for Science and Technology Studies, um, Association for Study of Literature and Environment, um, and uh, last but not least, Lassies that chipped into the very first filming trip in 2017. Uh, I would also like to say thank you to uh, David Hildner and to Marilyn Loyola that gave their beautiful voices to our film, uh, to Glenn Close, who is here and who always served uh, with his expertise in documentary filmmaking, uh, and obviously um, to uh, the people who worked, collaborated and traveled with me. First of all, Sainasurya Narainan, uh, who um, traveled and researched uh, uh, with me. And uh, this film is based on our collaborative research, but also Angel Polanco uh, from uh, the Uni Universidad Autónoma de Yucatán uh, and Reynaldo Morales and Marcos Colón who helped with uh, filming. I would uh, like to send special thanks to uh, Raquel Paraiso and her group Sotavento, uh, as well as um, Maestro Martiniano Perez Angulo and his group Tumen Kai, uh, who allowed us to use their beautiful music. And so many, many people in Yucatan who uh, helped us um, generously uh, taking us around, speaking to us and making this film possible. In spite of very, very generous support of so many people, our film had rather a small budget. So without a generosity of uh, strangers, we, were, uh, we wouldn't have been able to achieve anything. So um, we made this film to produce a testimony of the struggle to save beautiful, nature and culture of this area of Yucatan that is Maya land. And we titled the film after many years of discussing uh, what the title should be. We titled the film Maya land listening to the bees because the land and the bees are the actual protagonists of the film. And in, um, in uh, uh, doing so, in giving this title to the film, we believe we are connecting to um, the philosophy of life of the Mayan people. And we start the film with uh, this reflection. So I'm going to show you, show you the very beginning part of the film. La mirada de los pueblos mayas y todos los pueblos de Mesoamérica eh, difiere mucho de ese universo occidental donde fundamentalmente hay dos sujetos, Dios y el hombre. Por lo tanto, todo el resto es objeto, objeto de abstracción. En la mirada o en la cosmología de los pueblos originarios, ese universo no hay objetos, todos somos sujetos, incluyendo los árboles, las plantas. 
las piedras, los animales. Es un universo donde no hablamos de proteger los animales o proteger a la naturaleza, sino más bien de convivir con ella. Porque proteger implica una superioridad del hombre sobre, lo de, sobre el resto de la creación. Y esto es, una vez más, una reproducción de una mirada muy antropocentrista del mundo. Donde está yo soy el centro de la imagen eh, donde el mundo debe reflejarse y reproducirse. Esa mirada es muy megalománica y, y, y hace mucho daño. Estamos viviendo la mortandad de abejas que están ligadas con fumigaciones, tanto terrestres como aéreas. Reducción en sus poblaciones, lo que trae una consecuencia, una disminución de la producción de la miel y por lo tanto un menor ingreso para las familias campesinas mayas. Los reportes de afectaciones de maíz y calabaza y otros cultivos de los campesinos mayas como consecuencia de fumigaciones con glifosato y otros químicos. Además, se han encontrado animales muertos afectando la flora y fauna de la región. El impacto ambiental de esta deforestación es enorme por cambio de uso de suelo, pese a que no se han dado permisos para ello. Es evidente la rápida sustitución de la selva, rica en biodiversidad y prácticamente el último pulmón tropical en México, por áreas para el establecimiento de monocultivos, particularmente la soya. Ya no nos puedes seguir engañando. Ya falta, compañero. Yo sigue viendo la cara. Eso que, que tengo aquí, 100% garantizado, es la soya transgénica. Y no tengo, tengo miedo de decirlo. Porque es la verdad. Porque no, nosotros, como indígenas, no estamos preparados, pero sabemos defenderlo. Y eso es la prueba. Esa soya nos está acabando a nosotros las comunidades porque se está deforestando, se está acabando con la biodiversidad de la selva maya. ¿Cuánta abeja se muere? ¿Cuántos pájaros? ¿Cuántas especies de plantas que nosotros usamos para curarnos? Lo que sirve a las abejas para la miel, donde polinizan, donde recolectan el col, el pol, la miel el néctar, ya no hay. Esas especies se están perdiendo. So, uh, Pedro Pablo Chimbacap, the Mayan poet, whom you hear in the very beginning of the film, um, is one of the first uh, encounters that lead to uh, the production of the film. I met him in Merida in 2016 uh, during my first research trip when I was uh, not yet, uh, I didn't know yet that uh, that film is going to um, be produced. Um, um, but I was doing research on uh, Mayan um, um, resistance to genetically engineered uh, crops. That was the day that Sai and my son Mundo were going to join me in Merida. Uh, Huracan was approaching and th the city was really drenched in the rain. I was going towards the airport, I got very cold 
and to heat up and eat something warm, I entered uh, into a restaurant and um, ordered sopa de lima, a chicken soup with, with tortillas and, and lemon, which I only allow myself um, in these kind of situations. And um, the person who served me the soup was Pedro Pablo Chimbacab, who uh, was the owner of the restaurant. He won a competition of um, Mayan poetry and got a um, pretty high award for, uh, for these, as, as this award and opened a restaurant. So he sat near me and uh, asked me some questions um, and we started talking. I told him that I was trying to learn about Mayan culture and then he looked at me and said that he hated uh, American researchers who were trying to learn about Mayan culture. And then uh, they would write about Mayan culture as if, as if Mayan people were just objects and they were the subjects examining them. Um, at the very end of the film, if you watched it, um, these words of Pedro Pablo Chimbacab um, finish uh, are, are the ending conclusion of our film, but, but these words were also something that provoked me to, about, to think about the possibility of making the film uh, where um, Mayan um, activists and thinkers and intellectuals could speak directly rather than being mediated through uh, the uh, subjectivity of uh, myself uh, as a researcher. And we obviously at that time, we also thought, uh, talked a lot about uh, Mayan um, philosophy of life. Um, and uh, I thought that it is a very good uh, uh, way of starting the film um, to structure the, the, the st story through the conceptual framework of Mayan uh, approach um, so that the, my viewers know that we're not talking about the story environmental conflict, which is about resources, but that we are talking about the situation in which uh, bees, forests and water uh, that are uh, being uh, contaminated are uh, partners and uh, possibly even subjects uh, equipped with agency and thought. And Pedro Pablo Chimbacab surprised me because he was very knowledgeable uh, um, of Western philosophy and reminded me that there were a number of Western philosophers who also uh, thought of non-human subjects as uh, thinking and uh, here, for example, we could quote uh, Aldo Leopold and his Sand Almanac, where he uh, explains that thinking as a mountain, that means that is being aware of one's place in the ecosystem uh, is definitely better than insisting in thinking as an individual. So after the sequence, the sequence with Pedro Pablo Chimbacab, you meet three very important activists of a Mayan resistance against uh, genetically engineered soy. This is Veronica Eckkantje, who is speaking uh, in Hague in the tribunal against Monsanto. Um, Jorge Pech, who is shaking soy, and uh, his sister, uh, perhaps the, the, the most, the best uh, uh, known um, Mayan activist, uh, Lady Pech, who has received um, environmental uh, Goldman uh, Award in 2020. So um, as you heard, so is causing a number of uh, negative effects in the whole environment, uh, including um, deforestation, uh, biodiversity loss and human uh, health loss. But what is very important in our story is that bees were affected first. And when bees started to die, Mayan people reacted. Um, you see, Mayan people have a very, very special relationship with the bees that have lasted many thousands of years. And let me show you another clip that talks about that. Las abejas para nosotros es algo mágico, sagrado. Las abejas son parte de nosotros, lo sentimos así, parte de nosotros. Porque cómo se llaman las abejas, ya pues cómo se llama, polinizan las, la, los árboles, todo, ¿no? Pero pues eh, para nosotros es como una relación de, 
de, ¿cómo se llama?, de nosotros los humanos y los árboles, o sea, la naturaleza. Es como un intermediario entre ellos y nosotros, ¿cómo se llama?, al respetar, ¿cómo se llama?, las abejas, al, al trabajarlas, al cuidarlas, pues estamos cuidando todo lo que, las, ¿cómo se llama?, los árboles y todo, la naturaleza estamos cuidando. Las abejas son una parte de los ancestros, ¿no? De ellos aprendimos muchas cosas, tanto como en aplicarlo en medicinas, en como ya sea cicatrizantes para cualquier tipo de herida y todo eso. The Maya people have a spiritual relationship with melipona bees a stingless species of forest bee native to the Yucatan Peninsula. Their cultivation began over 3,000 years ago by the ancient Maya civilization and proved to be so essential to the Maya way of life that their deity, Ahmuz and Kab, takes the form of a melipona bee. Archaeological and historical records, such as the Madrid Codex, contain manuals with detailed observations of melipona behavior and biology. In the fourth and final cycle of the Yucatec Maya world, Ah Muzenkab is the creator of the earth and the universe. In the center of this world, a sacred tree holds up the sky, connecting it to the underworld where the bee god releases the trapped forces of life. La melipona es una abeja hogareña. Ese es quizá otro de los rasgos por los cuales también persiste, porque esta abeja es, forma parte del hogar en las familias mayas. Las abejas, cuando abres una colmena y puedes observar cómo es su conformación, cómo hacen su arquitectura, sus zumbidos, observarlas, es armonía, es prosperidad. Es un símbolo de que se puede trabajar en conjunto con un fin en común y que es el bienestar del, de lo colectivo. Entonces hay comportamientos de la civilización maya que se cree surgen a partir de la observación de las meliponas. Está, por ejemplo, que se cree que, que la forma como las meliponas construyen eh, su panal de cría simula una pirámide. U otra de que los sacrificios de princesas también fue a través de la observación de las meliponas. I need to introduce a little bit of complexity here. So um, the bees that you saw on uh, the screen in the hands of Mayan beekeeper in the very first sequence were not meliponas. They were apis bees. And these apis bees were brought to Mexico in the beginning of the 20th century by a rich man from the United States. Uh, Mayas have become very interested in these bees. And after uh, several years, Mexican government uh, decided to take advantage of this interest. Um, the Second World War caused a shortage of sugar on the world markets. And uh, Mexican uh, government decided to um, promote the model of development uh, in which Yucatec Mayan beekeepers would take care of apis, European bees. In the 1950s, the Mexican government incentivized Maya communities to adopt the practice of harvesting honey from imported European honeybees. The European honeybee, Apis mellifera, is larger than the melipona bee and can produce more than 10 times the amount of honey, making the Apis honey harvest a more economically viable option for beekeepers. Today, Mexico is the third largest exporter of honey in the world. And in Yucatan, 
90% of Apis beekeepers are of Maya ethnicity. So um, Apis bees were providing, Apis bees were providing um, financial resources to Mayan families. Melipona bees were still kept uh, for medicinal purposes, the honey that they produce have very strong medicinal purposes. Uh, and also they provided some sort of connection to the past and the meaning until, um, but, but Apis bees, Apis bees were slowly taking uh, the space of Melipona bees. Uh, so um, these changed in 1990s when something um, Mm, surprising happened. Mm, Africanized bees escaped from a Brazilian laboratory and traveled north, and they hybridized with apis bees, making them much more aggressive. And then mm, Mayan beekeepers uh, felt forced to move the mm, beehives with apis bees away from home, which opened the room uh, back for the meliponas. And that was also the time when uh, women such as lady um, decided that while their husbands are taking care of apis bees, they will be able to uh, take care of meliponas. And that moment empowered Mayan women, uh, various of which later became the main protagonists, the main activists of uh, the resistance that erupted after 2011. So in 2011, uh, Mayan honey that was sent to Europe traditionally um, was rejected by European authorities in the port of Progreso due to its being contaminated with uh, genetically engineered um, pollen. So I know that I have some, um, some students of science and technology here. Um, this was an interesting moment, the ways that European Union is measuring contamination of honey changed um, and that caused that event of uh, rejection of, of the honey. But that was also the moment in which Mayan people um, woke up and uh, became aware of many changes that the technology of genetically modifying plants introduced in their environment in, uh, in their area. And uh, in the beginning, they didn't know what does that all mean and what is really happening, uh, you can hear um, how one of the activists is talking about that moment. This is, again, Veronica Ek uh, Kanche. Nosotros en las comunidades nos dimos cuenta de que se está, estaba empezando a morir las abejas, ¿no? Nosotros el problema no lo sabíamos, ¿no? En sí sino que fue la mortandad de abejas, ¿no? Y nosotros buscábamos apoyos por parte de, del gobierno, ¿no? Que nos explicaran, ¿no? El por qué se estaban muriendo las abejas. Más no sabíamos que todo eso era porque sí se sembraba lo que es la, la soya transgénica aquí en nuestro municipio, ¿no? Y entonces, pues, tanto uso de agroquímicos, pues, Eh, las abejitas van en los cultivos y pecorean lo que es la soya. Entonces, el uso de tanto herbicida, pues los estaba envenenando. Ellos van en sus colmenas llevando el veneno en sus patitas y pues prácticamente envenenaban su colmena. ¿no? Nos empezamos a, a platicar entre las demás comunidades y, y nos dimos cuenta que el problema de que vivíamos nosotros en nuestra comunidad es lo que estaban viviendo las otras comunidades. Yes, so uh, th th there is going to be another interesting moment connected to technology here because Mayan people realized that they were surrounded by a genetically engineered soy plantation that have been planted during the first years, 10 years of the 21st century mainly by Mennonites that emigrated from um, Northern Mexico. And as you probably know, Mennonite communities usually are very careful with technologies. However, they were not aware that uh, here they are introducing one of the most cutting edge 
edge technologies, which is genetic and engineering of uh, crops. And this is uh, this other culture that uh, is protagonizing the story um, we are narrating in the field. In the Yucatan Peninsula, GM soy is predominantly grown by Mennonites, an immigrant group of religious refugees originally from Central Europe. Mennonites have benefited from the active support of the Mexican state authorities since the 1920s. President Alvaro Obregón invited them into the country, believing that their industrious nature would help develop the agriculture in northern Mexico destroyed by the revolution. In the 1990s, the pacifist Mennonite communities in the north were disrupted by drug cartels, causing them to migrate south to Campeche and Yucatan. Today, the Mexican government pays subsidies to the Mennonites in exchange for growing GM soy. One of the richest Mennonite communities is the Salamanca settlement in Quintana Roo. Although only 10 kilometers from the nearby tourist town of Bacalar, it can feel like a world apart. Johann Berge tells us the history of the community here and how they managed to cut down more forest than permitted. Para empezar, nos dieron un permiso de para cuatro campos, que son aproximadamente 1,600 hectáreas. En el transcurso del tiempo que desmontaron esos 1,600 hectáreas, se nos venció el permiso. No nos han vuelto a dar otro permiso. Pero la ventaja aquí es que es un ejido. Un ejido aquí en México tiene mucho derecho, tiene mucho poder. Entonces empezamos con otro permiso, a ver si nos autorizan otro permiso, pero cada que autorizamos un permiso nos están negando eso, no nos dan. Y ellos nos niegan el permiso y así fuimos desmontando poco a poco. Eso lo que usted ve desmontado ahorita, eso no fue de golpe, eso fue poco a poco, paso por paso. So um, the interesting uh, note about Johann Berge is that he's also a beekeeper and he uh, is losing bees, but he does not associate the bee loss with uh, the monocrops and pesticides that are surrounding his beehives. Anyway, this completely different uh, philosophy of life that, uh, as you can see, um, Mennonite community has um, and um, completely different one uh, that Mayan community have has generate tensions. And here you can uh, listen to Feliciano Ucan, one more uh, uh, activist uh, belonging to uh, the Maya uh, Chienes uh, collective protesting against GE soy, um, how he talks about this tension between these two communities. Los menonitas no se miden esas personas a seguir deforestando. Aún habiendo una suspensión, lo siguen haciendo. Ellos sí saben que están haciendo un daño, pero hasta en estos momentos no lo están asimilando porque lo que ellos tienen en la mente es signo de peso. No hay autoridad que les pueda parar y por eso nosotros estamos en contra de todo lo que estamos 
eh, viendo que lo que está sucediendo. Sí, no estamos en contra de, de los productores también, también ellos tienen derecho de trabajar, pero que cambien el tipo de cultivo, que ellos puedan trabajar igual y que nos pongamos de acuerdo. Well, so the wisest of the activists realized that the conflict uh, between the communities should not be uh, should be extinguished and that the actual responsibility was falling on the Mayan government. So my uh, the Yucatan government, Mexican government. So the Mayan community organized uh, to protest and to um, uh, demand that uh, Sagarpa uh, revoke uh, the permission to plant genetically engineered soy. And I want to show you a few moments of this struggle uh, that uh, has some Zapatistas elements in it because it really mobilized international community through very wisely uh, chosen strategies. And it also had a lot of art. The Maya became more organized, an array of allies emerged. Scientists, business leaders, politicians and activists supported the Maya in their struggle. We were invited to participate in this project by various organizations, in which, on all sides, we were given carpet carpets. On all sides, we didn't want to see, we didn't want to hear. So what was discussed among all those who were organized was that, in some way, fuéramos a los centros ceremoniales, desplegáramos una letra que diga ma, que, que significa no. OGM, no a los transgénicos. Claro, esto de cierta manera nos pudimos, tuvimos que coordinar con Greenpeace y todo, de tal manera que cada grupo, un grupo se fue a Chichén, otro grupo se fue a Uxmal, y en un momento dado, todos los que fuimos parte del colectivo, desplegamos la palabra no queremos transgénicos. Y en ese momento pasaba una avioneta y nos tomaba la foto para publicar al mundo que no estamos de acuerdo con una semilla no consultada, una semilla no informada y por lo tanto que afecta a nuestra economía. So, what was very important, uh, what is very important in our story is the process of building of alliance. And, um, a, Alliance consisted of scientists, uh, lawyers, international activists, um, honey exporters, but perhaps the most important part of uh, building that alliance was connecting different Mayan groups. And one of the most important of these groups were uh, the guardians of the seeds. Uh, and milpa growers. If there is any other uh, species that is more important than bees, to Yucatec Mayans, this is maize. And as many of you know, milpa is this Mayan old polyculture as old as, uh, as melipona bees uh, relation with Mayas, uh, where different plants, maize, beans, squash, um, are uh, growing uh, together helping each other in the process. So I invite you to see a, a clip about that Mayan group that supported uh, the beekeeper struggle because they realized that soy is also taking over their uh, culture of the land. Ha habido muchas variedades de, de semillas nativas, nativas que ha venido de nuestros ancestros. La hemos cuidado. Cada familia, cada campesino ha estado cuidando esas variedades. Y yo creo que pues, este, no es justo eh, que desaparezcan. 
Entonces, no queremos monocultivos, no queremos productos este, de soya o maíz transgénico, los modificados, cosa que pues, este, nos lesionaría mucho. En primer lugar, nos van a privatizar, nos van a privar nuestra, de nuestra producción de maíz. Entonces, ya no vamos a tener este, la forma de cómo producir lo que libremente queremos producir para nuestra alimentación. Entonces, van a venir empresas, gentes de que nos, nos obliguen a producir una variedad que no estamos acostumbrados a producir en nuestro medio. Dice esa vida. No como lo dicen los políticos. Eh, los políticos dicen de que sin maíz no hay país. Es una mentira. Puede ser. Pero ya políticamente lo Yo como campesino, como productor, digo que para mí maíz es vida. Es la diferencia que tenemos acá ya entre, entre los grandes políticos. Nosotros como campesinos. Creo mucho en la vida. Y lo defendemos con uñas y todo, con, con los datos. Hay que defenderlo como se pueda. Aunque no es tan fácil. Hay que pelearse con nuestras autoridades, con nuestros gobiernos, con los, quizás con algunos centros, con gente muy, muy poderosos. Maíz fue la base del desarrollo de la civilización maya. Por eso el maíz adquiere un valor eh, religioso, por lo tanto sagrado, adopta la, toma automáticamente la forma de deidad y, y todas las historias vinculadas con la creación del mundo y la humanidad, sobre todo la humanidad actual desde esa mirada, fue hecho de maíz, de ahí la idea de que los mayas pues, fueron hechos de maíz, son personas de maíz. La práctica de la milpa implica no solamente quitar ese espacio de vegetación y sembrar el maíz, no. La práctica de la agricultura implica primero el respeto a los señores de la vida, que es la religión maya, es la cultura en sí que empieza a darse. Implica discutir también con la familia, con la comunidad. Implica hacer ceremonias para atraer la lluvia implica también hacer ceremonias a que yo pueda hacer mi compadre al otro para formar el tejido comunitario. Implica muchas cosas. Esto entonces, la práctica de la milpa, es la que ha dado vida a lo que yo le puedo decir. Esta lucha del pueblo maya, la milpa es la parte que, que le da sostén y que inclusive la propia milpa es la que movilizó la guerra de castas o el movimiento social. ¿Por qué? Porque la propia milpa implica primeramente la defensa del territorio. So as we were progressing uh, in our research, we were realizing that uh, the technology of genetically modifying uh, crops uh, was affecting bees, then that it was affecting uh, Mayan culture and uh, its uh, forests and its uh, milpas. But then there was one more thing, one more very important element about which I haven't talked yet. That was the contamination of water. And here, uh, Angel Polanco's research uh, at the La Universidad Autónoma de Yucatán uh, turned out to be very important. I actually started to uh, hear about uh, the research of Polanco while I was talking to the Mayan activists who were quoting me uh, numbers of uh, toxic substances that were being discovered in uh, Yucatec uh, waters. And also they became aware based on this research on, uh, of the uh, growth of the rate of cancer. So, so again, interesting moment for science and technology studies, science creating problems, and then science uh, also uh, helping to achieve an awareness uh, of uh, these problems. And I'm kind of running out of time, but I'm going to show you one more clip, a little bit more about water. I think it's very interesting for everyone who is traveling to Yucatan, it is showing also connection to the Sargasso infestation uh, of uh, the beaches. Mm -hmm. 
El agua es sagrada para los mayas, ¿no? Desde tiempos ancestrales, de ello depende la vida, ¿no? Entonces, de ahí que eh, se está empezando a tomar conciencia de las comunidades respecto a la contaminación. Como ustedes pueden ver, es un área eh, muy pedregosa, así está todo el estado de Yucatán. Eh, se llaman sistemas cársticos. Y eh, bueno, en Yucatán tenemos eh, entre 4.000 y 5.000 cenotes. Eh, este tipo de sistemas de suelos cársticos o pedregosos son altamente eh, permeables. Eh, dejan pasar todo tipo de, de elementos químicos hacia el acuífero subterráneo, hacia los cenotes. Pues hemos realizado estudios sobre agroquímicos, en especial los plaguicidas organoclorados. ¿no? Y bueno, hemos encontrado altas concentraciones de ese tipo de plaguicidas. Estamos hablando de DDT, heptacloro, lindano. Entonces son un grupo de plaguicidas altamente tóxicos, cancerígenos, que de hecho están prohibidos en, por convenios internacionales que sí existen relaciones entre eh, la bioacumulación de ese tipo de, de, de químicos y la, el desarrollo de diferentes cánceres. Yucatán siempre ha estado en los primeros lugares en cáncer cervicouterino y mamario en Yucatán a nivel nacional, por arriba de las tasas promedio de mortalidad. Una de las especies más afectadas por contaminación del agua y por agroquímicos, por toda clase de agroquímicos, son las abejas. El agua es muy importante como parte de la alimentación de las abejas. Son primordiales en, en la cadena natural ¿no? para la producción de alimentos, la polinización, los, todos esos procesos. El exceso de nutrientes en cuanto a agroquímicos, me refiero en particular a los fertilizantes con alto contenido de fósforo, potasio, nitrógeno. Todo viene escurriendo desde el centro de la península y viene arrastrando todo tipo de contaminantes de agricultura, de la industria, se filtra al manto acuífero y desemboca en las costas, en la costa maya, la Riviera Maya, que era el mayor atractivo de nuestro país. Está lleno de sargazo toda la costa. ¿no? Todo ese exceso de nutrientes hace que proliferen las algas, las microalgas, ¿no? los dinoflagelados y se exponencia la, la producción de mareas rojas, también de sargazos. ¿no? ¿Por qué? Porque hay un exceso de nutrientes que combinado con el cambio climático se elevan las temperaturas, mucho alimento y hay una proliferación exponencial de algas. ¿no? So it is not only bees, not only uh, Mayan culture, but like everybody living on Yucatán is affected negatively by uh, this uh, model of uh, development. And there's one last sentence with which I'm going to finish. Um, one of the activists that um, I met in the very beginning and who introduced me to, to many people and many problems is uh, Arturo Luis Cartillo. And he just in one minute sums up the whole situation. De todo este modelo agroindustrial, los únicos que se benefician son las transnacionales. Es decir, ver a los productores, aquí y en todos lados los productores están siempre al filo de la quiebra. Los consumidores estamos todos contaminados por tanto agrotóxico. ¿Quién se beneficia? Bayer acaba de comprar a Monsanto en 63 mil millones de euros. ¿De dónde sacan tanto dinero? Del veneno que nos estamos comiendo. Ellos son los únicos que se benefician. Todos los demás perdemos. So, uh, in this uh, presentation, I talked to you about Mayan uh, philosophy of nature and about the uh, model of development that uh, began, begin to harm and their culture and their nature, and the struggle, the building of the alliance, the analysis. And the second part of the film um, that I have uh, not had time to present and I uh, in invite you to, to watch, still for a few days the password is going to be available, is um, about attempts of Mennonites, some of the Mennonites to start agroecological production, give up pesticides, and also um, 
a vision of the world in which bees would be the litmus test of the uh, quality of development. How would the world look like if we gave priority to the bees? Uh, again, I would love you to, to see it. Uh, the film, we will still be working on the film. So um, I would love to hear uh, um, criticism, questions, um, suggestions. Uh, thank you so much for being here with me.